Hi, my name's Carl, and I'm going to say a few words today about the amphibians of Pickaway County, Ohio, and the neighboring region. First, a few words about amphibians in general. You know, how do we tell the difference between you know, an amphibian and, say, a bird or something, or a reptile? To start with, amphibians have moist skin, and as a result, they're um, relatively prone to drying out and are often associated with water or at least moister places, although there is some variability with this, and toads, for example, um, might be found in some drier places. Another thing is that they are born from eggs that do not have um, any substantial shell, just a thin membrane, and these eggs are either laid in the water or in an extremely moist area so that they don't dry out. After hatching from the egg, they almost always pass through a larval stage, such as the tadpole in the case of a frog. The exceptions are a few salamanders where the larvae actually transform into um, the adult form while they're still inside the egg. There are two, two groups of amphibians that occur in Ohio. There are the frogs and toads, um, which as adults lack a tail and also have a familiar squat body form, which we'll see momentarily. And then there are salamanders, which have tails as adults and a more elongate body form. I'm going to start with the frogs and toads. And the first example is the bullfrog, which is a large frog. Adults can be over five inches long. They typically occur near larger bodies of water like lakes and ponds. One distinguishing feature which is important for um, differentiating the bullfrog from the green frog, which we'll see in a moment, is that the bullfrog lacks a dorsal lateral fold which would go down the length of the back on each side. And in the case of the bullfrog, it just, this fold just kind of curls around the eardrum and then drops down to the forearm. The tadpole stage of the bullfrog is shown here. It's also um, quite large. This is in the hands of my son when he was six years old. And you can see the head and the body of a tadpole are typically kind of a single unit. There's the eyes. And then there's a substantial tail with a tail fin on it. And you can just barely see um, some rear legs starting to grow there. And when it transforms into an adult frog, of course, the legs will grow, the tail will disappear, and then you will have a young bullfrog. The green frog is very similar to the bullfrog in appearance. It's a little smaller, typically four inches or less in length. Um, similar habits, although it will also inhabit smaller bodies of water, including creeks and ditches and um, tiny ponds. And its distinguishing feature from the bullfrog is the presence of this dorsal lateral fold, which is a raised um, line on each side, which extends from behind the eye down the back. Another um, frog species, which is similar in size to the green frog, so up to about three or four inches, is the northern leopard frog. It is distinguished by the um, large, um, typically oval brown spots on the back and on the legs. The other color besides the spot can be uh, tan or cream or green in this case. This is a frog that although it breeds and lays its eggs in water during the warmer months, it may scatter widely um, into fields and grassland, which seem to be its preferred habitat. A smaller frog is the spring peeper. It maxes out at about two inches long. It is most commonly seen in the spring when it calls by these high-pitched um, peeping noises, which you may hear, um, especially after dark and on rainy nights in March and April. It has a characteristic kind of X pattern on its back. Here's another example of a spring peeper, which is peeping, which, that is, it is calling using its vocal sac located on its throat. And these are the male frogs call to attract the females, and this particular individual was up on some vegetation along a roadside ditch at night calling, and I actually got lucky and 
managed to photograph it in the process of calling. The gray tree frog is um, a relatively small frog, but a little bit larger than the peeper, up to about three inches. It is a gray um, frog with kind of a lichen pattern on the back. You can see that it has these toe pads, and it's very adept at climbing um, just about anything, including trees and houses and vegetation. It calls throughout the summer and um, is widely distributed in Ohio. This is an example of a gray tree frog which actually climbed up to our second story window on our house and I took a picture of it through the glass. You can see its toe pads in action here and also this orange color on parts of the hind legs that you normally wouldn't see. These are flash colors is what they're called and it's believed that these colors may confuse predators when the frog for example is leaping to try to get away. I should also mention that there are actually two species of gray tree frogs in Ohio which are extremely similar and can only be differentiated by their call and some other very subtle features, so we won't worry about that difference. The American toad is a very common species throughout Ohio. It is a fairly large um, animal up to about four or five inches long. It has a warty appearance. You can see the uh, rough skin that it has. And although it breeds and lays its eggs in the water, during the summer it will venture quite far away in, from water and can be found just about anywhere in Ohio. It also gets along relatively well with people, and this is the one of the more common amphibians to see in your backyard in an urban situation. I would also point out that these um, large raised glands on the top of the neck are called parotid glands and they actually can release a poison if the toad is disturbed and so for example if a dog were to um, bite the toad the dog may get an unpleasant surprise of some extremely um, yucky tasting poison in its mouth and this is a very uh, effective defense mechanism against predators and there are relatively few animals that will eat um, American toads and they typically have special adaptations or strategies to work around this poison issue. Now I'm going to move on to the salamanders. This is the F stage of the eastern newt. The eastern newts are um, born from eggs in the water. They grow as larvae and then they transform into this F stage, which is kind of the teenager life stage of the newt. It's not quite an adult yet. It's terrestrial. You'll see it's got a, a kind of a rounded tail with sort of rough skin and it's very brightly colored. It also has toxic properties and many animals will not eat it. And this is one species of salamander that you're actually um, somewhat likely to see during the day. If you have a rain during the daytime in the summer and these newts are present, these Fs will come out and walk around during the daytime <clears throat> on the forest floor. Now, when they're fully adult, the newts actually return to the water. And you'll see that their color returns to or becomes an olive drab um, color with a tail fin appears and certain features like the red spots um, are preserved from the F stage. They go back in the water and live and breed in ponds and other bodies of water. It's a very um, unique life strategy that they have. The spotted salamander is a large salamander. It grows up to about six inches long. It breeds in the early spring, typically in March, in um, small ponds and vernal pools and ditches. And you may see it crossing the road on a rainy night in March. It's large and um, quite striking when you see one with these large, um, large yellow spots. And so the eggs are laid in the water. They hatch into larvae and several months larvae Sorry, after several months, the larvae will um, leave the water and go live as adults from there forward. A similar species to the spotted salamander is the Jefferson salamander. 
which is about the same size, but it is a gunmetal gray color, perhaps with some blue flecks. It also is likely to be seen crossing roads in um, spring rain time, so keep your eyes open. You can see the double yellow lines on a road that this one was crossing. Along creeks and streams, there are additional salamander species. The Southern two-line salamander is typically about three inches long and has um, these, it's called a two-line salamander because it has these two lines um, extending down its back, which are relatively free of spotting or modeling. It's, um, sometimes the lines aren't well-defined, but that's the, the name that it goes by. It has an interesting um, breeding strategy. The mother salamander, the female, lays the eggs on the bottom of rocks underwater, typically in creeks. And so this is a situation where I lifted up the rock and I saw the mother salamander and the eggs are also attached to the bottom of the rock. And the mother stays with the eggs until they hatch, which is a few weeks, and um, presumably protects them against um, many types of predators, such as invertebrates, that might want to eat these eggs. After the eggs hatch, they, um, the salamander is in the larval stage when it's fully aquatic. It has a tail fin, which you can't see very well in this picture, but it also has these external gills, which I'll show in more detail on the next slide. But you can see it's starting to develop, develop a pattern that's similar to the adult salamander. Here's a close-up of the head and gills of a two-line salamander, southern two-line salamander larva. And you can see these external gills. This is how it extracts oxygen from the water. And it's something that disappears when it transforms into an adult salamander. Another salamander, which tends to live in wooded areas, is the eastern redback salamander. It's completely terrestrial, and it doesn't actually need any body of water to live or to breed. It lays its, um, its eggs in moist areas underground, and when they hatch, they've actually already completed their larval stage, and they're miniatures of the adults. Typically, this salamander has a red stripe down its back, such as this one does, hence the named Eastern Redback Salamander, although sometimes this stripe may be more of a cream color or even absent. So this is just a sampling of the amphibians that might occur in the Pickaway County area. I've tried to pick the ones that you're most likely to see, but there are many more that you might see. For a complete list, um, one good source of information is a publication by Ohio's Division of Wildlife. It's called Amphibians of Ohio. It has, covers every species. It has photos. It has distribution maps. And it's distributed free of charge by the Division of Wildlife in print form. And it's also available online as a PDF file from the link that I've given here. So thank you for your attention and have a great day.